About this time of year, every year, those involved in the mobile phone industry around the world gather for a congress, conversation, and a chance to discuss and show off everything new. And this year, it was once again held in Barcelona. Welcome to our Mobile World Congress report. And this year's show started with a rush of activity. Sony announced a phone with gaming functionality. We don't want you to have to play just touchscreen Angry Birds the entire time. We want you to play true console quality games. And with that, you need a sturdier gamepad. Then the Taiwanese and Koreans went head to head with loud and proud presentations extolling the virtues of their latest handsets and tablets. Now we'll get to the tablets in a moment, but first the phones. This phone really takes the mobile smart device to a whole different level. It's super AMOLED plus uh, screen, 4.3 inch. It's the lightest, thinnest smartphone there is on the market. Added to that, it's got the latest Android software, our own TouchWiz 4 user interface, and heaps and heaps of entertainment and content packages. On top of that, we also have four hubs, which bring together music, reading, games, and social interaction. So it really is a stunning piece of kit. 4.3 inch display, make your own 3D videos. LG went not one, but two better, with a 3D phone. 3D you can see without glasses, incidentally. And they announced a new tie-up with YouTube in 3D. HTC then followed with their new phones, and they brought a new friend along to their press presentation. Last year, HTC took the initiative and decided to build more social features into the core of these new devices that they're announcing today. A lot has been made about a single Facebook phone, but this year you can expect to see dozens of phones with much deeper social integrations than anything we've seen so far. There is this little social networking button right here. What do you think it does? Take you to the website? Launch an app? Well, that would be so unimaginative. And that's not the HTC style. What we did was to create an experience where social networking is an aspect of the entire phone experience. For instance, if you are taking a photo, this button will breathe. And that's telling you that whatever you are doing, you can share that with your social network. Later this year, we're going to release a version of Internet Explorer 9 but despite this brace of boundary-pushing hardware, the top topic of Congress conversation was the marriage, some said unlikely union, of a couple of tech veterans. Nokia has incredible capabilities that are well known to everybody in the audience, whether it's industrial design, deep expertise in key areas like camera and sensor technology, uh, broad, very efficient uh, supply chain capabilities, we're sure from that base that Nokia is going to be able and will deliver absolutely phenomenal Nokia Windows phones. I think when you look at our strategy, you know, it is actually two different things going on here. So on one hand, in the Western markets, you know, the smartphone penetration is getting bigger and bigger. And so therefore the relative weight of that business or that segment has become more and more important. However, at the same time, you have to remember that, you know, the first time phone users are also because economy is getting better and affordability of phones is getting better. So we have a massive opportunity to connect the next billion to the web. And that is something entirely different from the smartphone area, which seems to steal most of the thunder in shows like this. Okay, so where do you make the distinction? You need a smartphone to connect that next billion to the web, don't you? Or are you going to use another device? Well, I think you need a connected device. But when you look at the smartphones of today, they are still, you know, in the 150, maybe 100 uh, euro price point. And that is multiple, multiple months of salaries for some people. So our challenge in the low end is to innovate how you can connect that next billion without or with combining with the affordability. And so, you know, is it a smartphone? Don't know, but it will certainly connect the next billion. It will certainly not 
be able to be priced at 100. It needs to be significantly lower in price. And you have plans. That's what Absolutely. you want to do. Absolutely. You're going Absolutely. after that billion. Absolutely. That's, we see that as just as an important factor in our strategy of creating the ecosystem in the high end with Microsoft and then connecting the next billion to the web. Speaking to the Randall Show from Barcelona, the O2 boss agreed the next 12 months will be interesting. Definitely. I think 2011 is the year that customers really see the big changes from the digital opportunity. I think financial services is one that we hope to lead on. Uh, O2 money has been in the market for about a year or so now, and we have about a million financial services customers. But this summer and autumn, customers will start to see uh, e-wallets, so effectively um, mobile financial services, so you'll be able to use your phone to make payments in retail stores stores and it will actually bring the, the, the mobile uh, payments uh, model to life. So 2011 with near field communication and a new range of devices will make it a very exciting time for financial services in your pocket. The remote control for your life will be your mobile phone, a good replacement for the good old fashioned wallet. Now tablets. The argument in Barcelona wasn't so much as whether you'd got one to sell as just how um, big it is. That's a 10.1 inch screen. The size of the screen is 4.1 inches. I'm sorry, what did you say? Because of the, the size of the screen is 4.1 inches. Uh, okay, you'd better explain. Uh, the ViewPad 4 is our flagship uh, device. We're classing it as a tablet, but it is full phone capability. So at the moment, where does a tablet become a phone? So it's a kind of, a, it's, a, uh, it's an interesting question. We're saying that this is a tablet device because of the, the size of the screen is 4.1 inches. Uh, we class four inch and below more in the phone territory. So this is becoming quite a good real estate to deal with. Um, but this is a fully certified Qualcomm, one gigahertz Qualcomm device. Um, but most importantly, it's gonna come with the latest version of Gingerbread. And the specification of these devices, tablets or phones, can only really be achieved by the relentless improvement in chip design. We've been a wireless company from our beginnings, and you know it's not been a project within the company, it is the company. And so we understand this very limited environment that we operate in, both from a, a power consumption standpoint and uh, lack of bandwidth. And so what we've done, you know, we've really been able to miniaturize the technology. This is our 8660 chipset, dual core, uh, with all of that capability on a, on a single device like this. And you open up you know, computers and you'll see a lot more going on. Uh, so it's really a hallmark for the company. I said, you know, imagine the auto industry bringing out an engine that has 500 horsepower but gets twice the gas mileage. And that's exactly what we're able to do when we uh, spin these different generations of chips. While the shiny new hardware can steal some of the limelight, this show is as much about the applications of mobile technology. And we have what's uh, called the bioharness. Bioharness is a, uh, it's a chest strap that you wear, and it's uh, similar to a standard heart rate monitor, uh, but it has much more sophisticated capabilities, including a, a fully configurable electrocardiogram output. We've got uh, breath rates, so do things like predicting VO2 max with it. You can uh, have skin temperature displayed, rate of activity, and um, you can also see with our optional plugins, blood pressure and uh, saturation of oxygen with a uh, pulse oximeter. Uh, the Chilean miners uh, the, uh, incident that, uh, that many people may have recalled, actually by a harness were used in that case. It was used to monitor uh, all the, uh, the miners while they were waiting to be extracted and they were able to see all of their vitals up on the surface. So it was very important in that context and that gives you an idea of how remote vitals monitoring could be uh, very useful. Here's another demonstration of health data being used over the mobile phone network. Here's some standard bits of kit that will measure the way my body's performing. A heart monitor I can wear on my chest. This little chap here, I can put my finger in there. It'll give me a pulse rate and it'll measure my blood oxygen percentage. Mine was healthy when I tried it a few moments ago. If you're a diabetic, you can put the standard blood test slips in here, measure my glucose level, and of course there's a cuff here for blood pressure. Now the point is all these devices can then talk to this, a mobile phone that doesn't make phone calls. Instead, the data can go up to a server, I can check it there, my relatives can check it there, and most importantly of all, my doctor can check it there. 
from the infirm to the elderly. Meet the man who, when his mum got confused with her mobile phone, designed a new one just for her. She even went to the UK for language course and things like this. So I thought it can't be that my mother is getting stupid not understanding the mobile phone and it really made me worried, a little bit upset even. And then I realized it's not my mother getting stupid, it's the mobile phone which is designed stupid that the people can't use it. And then I decided to design a mobile phone which my mother easily can understand, which she will love to use and which also other people, other elderly will enjoy to use. If you get older, you are getting some deficits, which means, of course, you don't see so well anymore, you don't hear so well anymore, uh, your tactile feeling is not so precise anymore, and all these deficits we try to compensate. So on the scene, of course, the point is about big button on the keypad, but what is very important, we also made very nice fonts on the display. So we specially designed the fonts for people who don't see so good anymore. And helping UK-based startup companies see their way into a more prosperous future is the work of UK Trade and Investment. And Trade Minister Lord Green was in Barcelona to see their work firsthand. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I think, firstly, the role of UKTI is extremely important, and I've heard that several times over already this morning, the way in which UKTI facilitates bringing companies together to share experience, to uh, understand each other's potential, because a lot of these companies are working with each other. That's what I find fascinating, selling services to each other, developing service capabilities for each other. This is a virtual industry almost by definition, yet they all say it isn't just enough to have virtual communications, they need to physically meet. That's what this Congress is doing for them. Have we got the regulation right, both for me as a consumer, that I get a fair deal, but also that companies like these are not having artificial barriers put in their way? The government uh, is determined to make sure that regulation is user-friendly. That's much easier to say than to do. There's a lot of detail to work through in a whole series of different spheres. I mean, one of the things that we need to be doing actually to ensure that the UK is competitive and continues to be competitive in one of the most important market sectors is to join up regulation so that the standards can evolve in a way that helps the mobile industry serve the wider community. Let's go for London. One of the companies the minister met was Musabi, who have an innovative approach to ticketing. OK, I can choose what kind of class of ticket, adult and a rail card. I'll travel today and then it'll connect up to the server and get times and prices, so I can now see different uh, times and different price options. I can even see the uh, changes on that route. Once I've selected to buy, I can then use an old credit card or put in a credit card fresh if I'm a brand new customer. When I want to repeat a credit card, I just use a CV2 from the back of the card and then make my purchase. So I then get back a human readable ticket that I can show to the guard if the guard doesn't have a scanner. But then if the guard has a scanner or I need to go through a gate, the modified gates can then see the barcode. And with a quarter of a second read, which is a similar speed to Oyster, I can get straight through the barrier and travel. And the thing is that whole purchase can be done while I stroll across the platform. I don't have to get there early anymore. I can know that straight away. All I have to do is get the NFC application enabled and click on the OK button, enter my PIN, and the transaction comes through. It's a confirmation. So I bought a ticket, The Godfather, my favorite movie, and I have paid for it using my NFC-enabled phone. And the transaction has gone into my credit card. So I paid five euros for this ticket on my credit card for the six o'clock show this evening. NFC, or Near Field Communication Devices, was another major theme of this conference, bringing a cash or even cardless society another step closer. But there's much more to more magic than just selling things to the wealthy. They believe there's a real future for mobile in the developing world too. Four years ago, we launched a mobile top-up service that is completely electronic. And that has enabled these customers, these people on the streets, to be able to trust their mobile phone in order to buy airtime. It has been able to create the trust in the minds of the distributors and the retailers that they can put $200 worth of airtime uh, that they can sell to their distributors and to other retailers and end customers. So uh, inherent education and trust has already happened. 
because there is no banking infrastructure and because the need to conserve cash, cash is the enemy because it is the most insecure piece of product that you can have in your pocket. So in order to secure cash and in order to keep their cash away from the muggers, the ability to use your mobile phone and load cash on it once the trust and the education piece is in place is very natural. And these countries do not have the banking infrastructure. They don't have your traditional telephony infrastructure. And they have completely skipped all the legacy stuff. And they have endorsed and in some ways are showing the developed world how to use their mobile phone to do financial transactions. You get predictions straight away. So before you've typed in anything. So here I'm going to say, hi, great to meet you today. Hi is already here, so I can simply select it by pressing it. Swift key is a British-invented app that's taken the Android market by storm. This year at Mobile World Congress, it won the accolade of Best App of 2011. And we're now up to around three quarters of a million downloads. And that momentum has really led into a lot of manufacturer interest. So at the start of this year, we've had two big announcements. First of all, we're fortunate enough to feature with Google as part of their Honeycomb Android launch on their new tablet device. So we launched an early prototype of SwiftKey tablet for the Honeycomb devices on the Motorola Zoom. And we've now also got the first Ink uh, phone, which we're actually proud to be the default keyboard on that. So it's our first licensing contract. Which brings us back to phones, smartphones, and they're getting smarter. What we're doing is vision-based augmented reality. So we're actually using that camera to see what the device is seeing and recognize certain images or objects in the environment. And then we can place graphics directly on top. And it makes for a completely different effect that works for a broader set of applications. So what we're going to show you here are actually some simple games that have been done with augmented reality. And we think gaming is a really interesting area. This one that I'm going to show you is actually a simple basketball game. So you might imagine this on the wall of your office at, at work, and it's really just an image of a basketball backboard. But what happens is when I point my device at it, I've got this game where I'm going to press play. You'll see, let me turn my basketball backward, backward right side up, and I now have a basketball hoop and scoreboard at the top. So here, I can shoot baskets right against, right against the hoop. So what's happened is I've turned the real world, I've turned that image into my actual game space. And now it stays fixed in place. And if you move over here this way a little, you can see I can actually come to a different angle and shoot off the board, and the basket stays in the same place. The computer vision technology, just the, we call them the algorithms, are, are new. So that's a new innovation. The other thing is just the sheer amount of computing power in the chipset. So clearing that one gigahertz threshold was very important for vision-based augmented reality. And of course, the more and more power we put in with additional cores and so on will also contribute to the experience. Show us another one. And as yeah, you sure. say, just explain, what is the camera seeing? What's the trick in, say, this picture here? Well, what does it need to see to make the reference points work? The camera is actually recognizing the entire image. And it doesn't store the entire image to do it. It actually memorizes a certain number of what we call natural features within this image. So to be recognizable, I actually have an image signature, which is comprised of a number of different points. Those points are stored on the device, and it's able to extract and then match those points to find that image. So what I'm going to show you now, Martin, this is actually a game called Paparazzi. <laughs> And this happens to be the winner of the Qualcomm's Developer Challenge uh, that we announced yesterday. And in Paparazzi, I'm actually a cameraman. I'm a paparazzi myself. And I'm going to see down here a very vain celebrity appear drinking a cup of tea. You can see our little vain celebrity. And my objective is to take close-up pictures of him for which I get awarded money. So I only got $10 there because I really did a poor job of getting him. And, and the problem is, is he's going to get angry as I do this, to the point where he's actually going to try and jump on my camera and break it. So I got another shot. There's $39. That was actually pretty good. Oh, here he comes. So you can see I've completely agitated this guy. He's now stuck on my phone, and I have to try and shake him off. And if I let him do this long enough, he'll actually put his feet up there too, and he will break the lens of my camera. <laughs> 
What do you think are the trends that matter? What's really new this year? I think there's a few things. I mean, I think we've seen new devices, which always happens. The 3D devices are interesting. Low-cost smartphones, so maybe $100 smartphones are interesting. We're seeing that high-speed connectivity to the phone. So mobile broadband getting up to speeds of about a gigabit with LTE is certainly an interesting trend. Putting mobile connectivity in every device, whether it's your heart meter, your utilities, your health monitor, whatever it is. Some countries seem to get this and have pushed ahead and said, let's go faster, let's go further. Others are dragging their heels. Isn't that maddening for your members? It's a and regulation of uh, spectrum is a country by country decision. So there's no sort of global mandate. I mean, from the GSMA, we're certainly calling for governments to make spectrum available for mobile broadband. We find that a 10% increase in mobile uh, penetration in a country drives GDP up by about 1.2%. So there's a direct link between making spectrum available and actually driving economic recovery. And that's about it from this year's Mobile World Congress. Next year, it's back here again in Barcelona, but they're staging the whole thing two weeks later than this year to avoid, they say, clashing with Valentine's Day. Thanks for watching.